All right, once again, welcome everybody to our virtual school garden club. My name is Dory Cooper and I'm the school programs manager with the Wild Center. We are based in Atlanta, Georgia and Decatur, Georgia, and our mission is to support resilient communities by connecting people to nature. And we do that in two ways through environmental education and through public green spaces. So we have five gardens throughout the city and then we work with kids and adults to learn about gardening, nutrition, environmental science, and all kinds of topics. And we've been doing this since 1997. So um, I've been in this field for a little over 10 years, and then our organization has been doing this work for quite some time. Today, we're talking all about pollination. Oh, I need to minimize this. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. We're talking all about teaching pollination in the school garden. So I know that pollination is a really great topic to teach in the school garden. Um, it's a really easy connection. Um, and so I wanna talk today about different ways that we can do this, but also what, oh, I, spoke, I spelled it pollination, <laughs> sorry, pollination, um, but also what pollination is, because I think sometimes as adults, these are topics that maybe we learned a long time ago, or we've just kind of understood at a passing level, and then when you go to teach it to, to seven-year-olds, you may find yourself stumbling a little bit. I know that's happened to me. Um, so today we'll go through just a little bit about pollination, I'll talk through types of pollinators, share some lesson plan ideas, and then keep the floor open for questions. So once again, at any point, feel free to interrupt me with questions. Okay, so first things first, what is pollination? There's um, a few definitions that I like to use. I think we very often simply understand it as this diagram, right, of bees going from one flower to the next. But the typical definition that I like to use is the act of transferring pollen grains from the male anther of a flower to the female stigma in order to produce fruit or seeds. And of course, this is reproduction. So when giving this definition to children, um, I think taking into consideration their age levels, um, when going through the details of this or the setting that you're at, um, I typically will keep it simple to taking pollen from one flower to another in order to make more flowers. I think the part that's helpful that I'll talk about in a little bit is this producing fruit and seeds part. Um, this is something that I get questions from adults a lot is if it doesn't produce a fruit, is pollination necessary for that plant? So we'll dive into that a little bit, but I would like to open the floor if anybody has any definitions of pollination that they like to use with their students or with children. And you can feel free to type that in the chat or come off mute. Additionally, if there's any keywords or phrases that are missing from this definition. Okay. Well, feel free to let me know if you have thoughts. So I like to use the example of the squash flower when teaching about pollination because I think it's a really great visual and it helps us really understand the importance of pollination and kind of the basics of it. So this is a squash flower. It appears to be like a yellow summer squash. And this one here is a male squash flower. I know it's a male squash flower because if you look at the base, it doesn't have a fruit like this one. So this is the female squash flower. And if you look at the base, there's a teeny tiny squash. Um, it looks like the stem. It's where the stem kind of connects to the blossom. So uh, you wouldn't necessarily notice it if you, if you weren't looking for it. 
Um, and this is something that I, I challenge you all to, if you grow squash to now that, you know, keep your eye on it, but, um, what will happen is these male flowers will, will grow and the male flowers always grow first on squash. And there's usually more male flowers than female flowers. And a nice little pollinator will go into this flower, get covered in pollen, go into the female flower, move that pollen over there. And then this fruit will grow. It will turn into a mature fruit. If this female flower does not get pollinated, this fruit will just shrivel up and die. And so you can see that with all sorts of vegetables um, and fruit and flowers, but the squash is where you can really see the impact of those fruit dying when they don't get pollinated. As a side note that we'll talk about in a moment, this is why a lot of times people will hand pollinate their tomatoes or their squash so that they're not losing those fruits. So with flowers like a sunflower or a zinnia or a marigold, the question I often get asked is, you know, what, why is pollination important for plants that don't fruit? And it's important because the seed still needs to grow. So that's the reproduction of that plant. So with the squash plant, the reproduction is the seeds are inside that squash fruit. And with like a sunflower, the reproductive seeds are inside the little seeds inside the flower. So what will happen is if a flower doesn't get properly pollinated, the seeds just won't be um, uh, mature or fertile and they won't be able to germinate into new plants. Almost like if you imagine a sunflower kernel, that's just, I don't know, really thin and empty inside and no kernel inside of it. Does this bring up any connections, ideas, or questions for anybody, the basics of pollination? Okay. So when it comes to pollinators, there are a few different kinds. Ooh, we got a good question in the chat. It says, last year I had an issue where I only had male flowers on my pumpkin plants. Why would that be? This does happen. Um, this has happened to me and it can be really frustrating. I don't really know the full reason why. I would assume it could have something to do with nutrients. Um, but I do know that um, male flowers grow first and you get a lot more male flowers than female flowers. So I think it is common to notice the male flowers more. And so, I don't know, I guess it's always possible that there was one and it didn't get pollinated in time and you missed it because it can be a really short window. But I don't really know why there wouldn't be any female. That would be a good Google to see if it has something to do with nutrients or maybe the type of pumpkin plant. Mark also asks about wind pollination. Wind pollination is absolutely a thing. Um, I'll try to remember to talk about that in just a moment. That's a great point. So with pollinators, this is what we typically imagine, right? We imagine this fuzzy little honeybee drinking nectar from the flower. So you can see this bee has, they have a kind of a straw-like nose that sucks the nectar out of the plants. And the nectar, of course, is kind of like a sugar water that they drink. And then that's what turns into honey when they bring it back to their hive. In that process, they get covered with pollen um, this bee is very happily getting covered in pollen, it looks like. And then as they jump from flower to flower, right, that pollen transfers. But there are a lot of other types of pollinators. So bees, of course, there's also butterflies. 
But then there's other things that we don't really think about as much. So other insects that might go from flower to flower, things like moths, beetles, flies, but then also different animals and creatures that hit the flowers or walk through flowers and are carrying pollen without really realizing it. So that can be birds, you know, birds love to hang out in the garden. They might land in some flowers, land in other flowers. They help pollinate within trees too. Um, other animals like lizards, possums, raccoons, rabbits, cats, dogs that are running through those patches of flowers. And then people too, whether that's on purpose to hand pollinate or whether they're doing something similar and walking through those spaces. And then as Mark mentioned, wind is a really good one that I didn't put on here. Absolutely, weather could play a part in this as well. Um, it also makes me wonder about rain. I had never really thought about that before. If the rain can get some pollen and drip it on something else. Um, anything that really moves pollen from one area to another would do pollination potentially. Of course, it doesn't always um, hit the mark, right? <laughs> it may not get to where it, it wants to go for reproduction, but um, it's definitely possible. Are there any other pollinators I'm missing on here that maybe have come up for you or your students before? I think something to point out here is that often some of these pollinators are not necessarily creatures that we, I think, stereotypically want to have in our garden, right? Like, we don't necessarily want rabbits coming into our garden to eat our plants, but they can be beneficial. Or similar things like moths, beetles, flies. I mean, especially certain moths have a really bad reputation for eating our plants, right? Or beetles that eat the plants. But they can also play a beneficial role. So these creatures that may seem harmful in certain situations or for certain plants can be beneficial for other plants. And that kind of goes into my point of the importance of biodiversity and using native plants. So by planting plants that pollinators enjoy, you're welcoming more biodiversity into your garden. So seeing some of those creatures, like all of those insects, um, is a sign that you have a biodiverse space, right? Or having animals and rabbits that want to be in your garden can be a good thing. Um, native plants are also great for encouraging native pollinators. Native plants also tend to be really attractive to pollinators. So we always recommend thinking about the biodiversity of your space and the native plants that you're planting. It looks like in the chat, we have an update about squash and pollination. B says squash are po pollinated by bees, usually the squash bee. If you take a look inside the flowers, you'll often see the male squash bee waiting for a female squash bee to come by. A predominance of male flowers usually indicates poor soil or too much nitrogen. Yeah, that, that could make sense. Thank you, B, that's helpful. So if that does happen, if you do notice that you have mostly male flowers. I think adding some compost, some nice fresh compost in there should help with that. Now that you say this, Bee, I do remember this happening at one of our schools that had some pretty poor soil. So I think that makes sense from my experience too. I hope that helps. So some of our favorite school garden plants for pollinators are a mix of uh, native and non-native, but really great for your garden. The first is chives and garlic. This is one of my favorites to put in pollinator gardens. And a lot of people think that only flowers are useful in pollinator gardens, but that's absolutely not true. Chives and garlic grow these huge, beautiful flowers. They're often purple or white, um, and they usually grow early in the spring season. So Pollinators love them. You'll get bees, butterflies, 
all kinds of things. And so they're a great asset to any garden, um, especially a pollinator garden. But it is also important to plant pollinator plants in your vegetable garden, because like with the squash example, it attracts more pollinators to your garden to be able to pollinate those fruits and veggies too. I also love marigolds. Um, we tend to get a lot of butterflies and bees on our marigolds at school gardens. And I think they're, um, they're really great for children to be able to identify insects on them because they're usually a big flower where the insect can kind of sit and hang out. And so it's easy for the children to observe insects and pollinators on those marigolds. So that's one of my favorites. And then two other great ones to add are milkweed. There is a native milkweed to Georgia. I think it's called swamp milkweed that has beautiful yellow flowers. But milkweed, most of us know about that as the monarch and the milkweed, the companions. So it's always lovely to be able to support milkweed in your garden when you can to encourage and provide food for monarch butterflies. Oops. And then lastly, another great native plant is the Eastern Coneflower or Echinacea. This one is um, really great for your garden as a native plant. It um, encourages those native pollinators and then it's also helpful for your soil. And again, it's a really pretty one that is easy for students to see when insects are on it. And it lasts, usually this one lasts from May through almost November, October, November. Marigolds are similar. They last a very long time in Georgia, so they're helpful to have in the garden too. Let me just check this chat box here. All right, so now I was going to move into some lesson plan ideas, but before I do that, I just want to pause one more time in case anyone has questions or ideas about planting pollinators in the garden. It looks like Jennifer commented that she had never thought about planting chives in the pollinator garden. Um, I think other herbs that are great to plant in the pollinator garden are oregano, that gets really pretty white flowers, or rosemary, gets beautiful purple flowers that the pollinators like. Oh yes, asters and goldenrod are also really great native plants for a pollinator garden. Thank you for mentioning those. Okay. So let's go through a few lesson plan ideas. So this picture, this is uh, Miss Tatiana, one of our educators. She's leading a field trip at our Edgewood Community Learning Garden. I chose this picture because there are tons of flowers in here, and I'm sure on this day she taught about bees and pollination, um, just because it's such a natural thing to teach when we have a flowering garden. And so I'll share a few of the activities that we do at the Wild Center, but again, I would also love to open it up to any ideas that you all have done or heard of or just want to brainstorm with. So the first is my favorite way to teach pollination. It's really hands-on and engaging and a lot of fun. I realized that we don't actually have, I couldn't find any Wild Center photos of kids playing this game. So I'll do my best to describe it to you. We use these silicone ice cube trays that are shaped like honeycomb and they're yellow and they're perfect. But I found this photo that shows how you can kind of create your own honeycomb. Um, these, just so you know, they're only about $10 on Amazon. And so we take these, this honeycomb to represent the hive. And I'll usually put them, you can do this in the classroom or in the garden. We mostly do it in the garden, but we'll find a central location to be the hive and we'll put out two or four of these trays. And then I like to stand there and say that I'm the queen bee. And our students are the bees, the worker bees that are going out to collect pollen or nectar. You can phrase it 
however you want to based on what you've been teaching. And that is represented by these little yellow puff balls. And so in the garden, I'll put, I'll get some cups and I'll work some kind of container and I'll put the puff balls in there and kind of sprinkle them around the garden in different places so the students hunt for them. In the classroom, you can create this little cutout or um, paper flower and place it on desks around the classroom. And then we have students buzz around the classroom or garden and collect one piece of pollen at a time and bring it back to the hive. And so um, it's a great activity to get them pretending to be a bee. It's very cute to have them flap their wings and buzz. Um, they'll also do this for hours if you wanted to. Uh, kids of all ages love it. I've done it with toddlers. I've done it with middle schoolers. Um, and the goal of this is to understand kind of the process of pollination that you're going back and forth, place to place, flower to flower. But it also does a great job at teaching teamwork. I like to say to students that it would have taken a lot longer for them to do this on their own, but with all of their hive and their colony, they're able to get it done fairly quickly. And then I also like to use this to help students with their fear of bees. So I'll usually say something like, when you were going out to collect pollen and coming back, you were really focused on the task. And so if a giant creature were to get in your way, it might scare you a little and disorient you. And that's what happens to bees. They're not trying to hurt you. They're just on a mission. But you could connect it to a few different things as well. So this is my favorite pollination game. Very fun. Some other lesson plan activities are to simply plant a pollinator garden. And this doesn't necessarily need to be, oops, this doesn't necessarily need to be in a school garden bed. You could find a spot at the school. A lot of times schools have kind of those landscaping areas at the front or the side um, that maybe you can get permission to plant some seeds. And it can be really simple, but the act of planting that pollinator garden can encourage students to support pollinators and understand the importance of, of flowers and plants. If you don't have access to an outdoor garden area, we like to make these a lot, which are wildflower seed balls. So we just use some clay or some compost and some dirt and kind of mix it with seeds and compact it into a ball. There's a bunch of different ways that you can do this with different materials. And the idea of this is that you, it's like gorilla gardening where you can just throw a seed ball and wildflowers will grow. Um, so they could take this home, you could plant it in like the tree line at the school, or you could use these to plant the garden too. Um, they don't necessarily work as well for that, but it, it's still fun for kids to do. This is an activity that um, Westchester Elementary did last year and shared with us. I think this might've been their kindergartners. They did a pollinator um, news broadcast puppet show where they made these different pollinators. They made, if you can see in the background, this is the pollinator habitat. And then they told the story with the pollinators and they made videos that they sent me. It was very, very sweet. And I think it was fun for the students. And then of course, a connection that you can make as well with pollination and pollinators is the insect life cycles. So this is, these are some um, pieces of a set for life cycles of a bee. And um, that's, a, that's a good connection to make as well for students. But I'd love to open it up to you all if you have ideas that have worked in the past or questions about some of those activities that I shared.
Okay, well, I'll take that as you don't have any questions. Um, thank you so much for, oh, we got one. That's great. Jennifer shared that they've planted seeds in pots that the students took home to nurture and then brought back to plant in the garden. How wonderful. That's great. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming today. I hope you learned a few ways to teach pollination at your school garden or with students to help inspire the, the future generations of the importance of protecting pollinators and learning more about the environment around them. Um, again, my name is Dory Cooper and I'm the school program manager at Wild Center. My email is here. If you wanna reach out to me at all, I love getting updates, photos, questions about how your work is doing and of how it's going. And we'll have one more webinar before the end of the school year. Um, in May, all about getting your garden ready for summer break because it's coming up fast. So I hope you all have a great day and we'll see you next time.